Thank you, Richard. <laughs> it's great to get that mask off. It, uh, it fogs my glasses, makes them dirty, all of that. But um, Happy New Year to you all. And uh, praise the Lord that he has kept us for another year. And uh, here we are, facing a new one. And uh, I trust that that will be a real encouragement for you, the fact that we're able to face a new year. On the way in, we were just listening to the radio, and of course, we always listen to 96.5, and uh, it had the pastor of River Life Baptist Church. That's the, the big, fairly new, well, new building anyhow over at Jindalee there, big church. And um, anyhow, he was, he was speaking, and he was talking about reminding us of New Year's resolutions, and of course, there's a number of uh, New Year's resolutions, and you know, including making more money people have, and uh, spending more time with family. And of course, the number one reason or New Year's uh, resolution was, and you probably know it, losing more weight. Everybody has a big Christmas and then wants to lose more weight. And um, this lady came into the bathroom and her husband was on the scales and he was sucking in his chest and she said, that won't help. And he says, well, it does. I can read the numbers now. So, so I thought that was, a, that was a good one. But, um, you know, when, when we kind of think of new beginnings and I come here today, well, it looks like more of the same, doesn't it? Because everybody's got masks on again. And, um, and so anyhow, um, it's, a, it's a good thing that we're able to be here today. And I wonder if you've made any New Year's resolutions. That's something that you can think about. I wonder if you've made any. Uh, it's always good to um, start off, isn't it, on a perhaps a, a, a new foot, make a fresh start if um, some things haven't worked out before and uh, it gives you opportunity to, to reboot and uh, rethink. I'd like to um, read some scripture to you in Matthew <clears throat> chapter 24. So if you have a Bible, um, We'll, we'll read this passage of scripture and have some, have some discussion about it. I'm reading in Matthew chapter 24 and I'm reading from verse 10 and uh, just through to verse 13. <clears throat> and I'm reading from the New International Version. And this is what it says. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. But the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. And then I'm reading again over in 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1 says, The Spirit clearly says that in latter times, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. I wonder if you know anyone who has abandoned their faith. Thinking, thinking, do you know anybody who has abandoned their faith? Somebody who once followed the Lord, somebody who, who clearly was involved in the Lord's work, and now have renounced their faith and don't want to have anything to do with the Lord Jesus. A couple of times a week, right, I have a conversation with a man who has abandoned his faith. They're just little prods and um, he's a spare parts interpreter. And uh, a couple of days ago, I spoke to him. I said, how did your Christmas go? And his immediate reaction was, don't do Christmas. This man was involved in ministry. He was a pastor of a church. And uh, he doesn't do ministry anymore. And he doesn't do Christmas. I wonder how your Christmas went. Yesterday, I received an email from the uh, CCC OS churches, and um, one of their headings caught my attention. 
and it was the advertisement of a book by Keith Glasgow. <clears throat> most, of, most of you or some of you would remember Bob Glasgow, Keith is son of Bob, and you'll remember, uh, remember Rosalind Sims, who used to worship here. That's Keith's sister, Mike and Rosalind. But anyhow, he's written a book, and it's called Exit. And it's regarding the reasons why people are exiting their faith and why young people are exiting their faith. And so there's a, there's a question I've bounced around at home over the last few days, asked a couple of young fellows, and, um, and this is the question. How confident are you that you'll still be a Christian in 10 years' time? Do you think you'll still be a believer in 10 years? You know, ultimately and decisively, God is our only hope for persevering in the faith. He's the one who keeps us. And in 1 Thessalonians 5, 19 to 24, it says, don't quench the spirit. Do not treat prophecies with contempt, but test them all, hold on to what is good, reject every kind of evil, and may God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept, be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. The Lord Jesus himself will keep you. In Jude 24, Josh has been speaking to us from Jude a couple of weeks ago. And in Jude 24, it says, To him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To him who is able to keep you. So ultimately... The Lord Jesus is the one who keeps us. Yet Christian perseverance is not passive. It's not something that just sits around on its butt and does nothing. It's not something that happens outside of us and around us, but it happens in us and through us. Lots of people think that perhaps I've given my heart to the Lord, that's it. Nothing more needs to be done. I'm a believer, I can live as I like. Not so. Christian perseverance takes effort. <clears throat> God commands us in reliance upon him to participate in the process of our perseverance in the faith. We're not only promised that God keeps believers, but we're also charged Keep yourselves in the love of God. So what we do in perseverance is not the ultimate, but it's important, it's essential. I want to bring to you some things that you can do that remind us that we need to persevere. And I want to talk about the power of habit. The word habit appears only once in the New Testament, and it speaks directly to perseverance. And it comes from the book of Hebrews, and that book is about perseverance. And this is what it says, Let us consider how to stir one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more, as you see the day drawing near. And so this particular a verse in negative terms, we're instructed not to develop the habit of neglecting to meet together with fellow lovers of Jesus. And so the positive implication then is that we should cultivate the habit of genuine Christian fellowship. Perseverance is, uh, is not mainly about unique one-off events and special mountaintop 
highs, but about daily, weekly, regular routines. You might call them spiritual disciplines. They're habits, habits of grace. There are lots of habits indicated in the Bible, habits that we can take note of. There are habits of uh, people around us too that we can take note of and perhaps a lot of those habits are bad habits or negative habits. Dad, don't leave the milk out. Put it in the fridge after you make the coffee. Make it a habit. I got that one yesterday. When I was uh, an apprentice mechanic, just a young fella across the road from the garage was the, uh, the pub. And of course, at six o'clock every, every day, with regular monotony, the same people would turn up at the pub. I didn't knock off till six. I knew who came. I knew who left. And so with regular mon monotony, those people had formed habits that um, they, had, uh, they had decided was important in their life. The Lord prayed habitually, and um, there are a number of uh, scriptures that remind us of that. In uh, Matthew 14, 23, the Lord sent the crowds away, and he went up on the mountains by himself to pray. In Mark 6, 46, after bidding them farewell, he left for the mountains to pray. In Mark 1, 35, in the early morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went to a secluded place to pray. Uh, to pray. In Acts 17, 2, Paul speaking, as was his custom, Paul went to the synagogue three consecutive Sabbath days. That was his custom. That was something that he did. And a habit is a, a settled or regular tendency or practice, something that you do habitually, regularly, constantly. In Daniel chapter 6, you'll recall Daniel in the lion's den. But, um, and you'll remember that those guys were out to get Daniel. And in Daniel 6 and verse, said, and verse 10, it says, Now when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened toward Jerusalem. Three times a day he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God just as he had done before. That was his habit. That was his habit, just as he has, had done before. Uh, he got down to pray before his God. I wonder if there's a habit in your life that could get you thrown into jail. Now, that's a scary thing. I wonder if there's a habit in your life that could get you thrown into jail. And uh, that's what occurred in the life of Daniel. And he was thrown into the lion's den. There are keys to better habits, and it's been said that your, your keys or your perseverance under God is in your habits. Someone has said heaven and hell hangs on habits. We could argue about that. Show me a man's habits and you'll give me a glimpse into his very soul. The habits you develop and sustain today will affect whether or not you persevere till the end or make shipwreck of your faith. That's a challenge. Simply put, your habits are one of the most important things about you. So I've got four lessons here that might help you get intentional and become more effective in cultivating life-giving habits for the Christian life. Now, habits, they free our focus. They free our focus from distraction so that we can give attention to what's important and be more fully aware in the moment while continuing to carry on regular tasks and actions. 
So by forming good habits, for instance, by making a beeline to the Bible in the morning, by praying at meals, by praying at regular points throughout the day, by meeting together with the body of Christ like we are here, we position ourselves in the paths of God's grace. By forming regular habits, we position ourselves in the paths of God's grace. Habits free us from being distracted by our own actions so our attention can focus on God. If you lie down out in the middle of Compton Road, most likely you'll get run over by a car or a truck. That's what you need to expect. You know what? If you make a habit of coming to church, you might get run over by the grace and mercy and the love of God. And what an amazing thing that would be. So if you make it your habit to lie down in the middle of Compton Road, death awaits. If you make it your habit to meet with fellow Christians regularly, most likely you're putting yourselves in the paths of God's grace and love and mercy where you can be encouraged, you can be challenged by the word of God and by other believers. And so we put ourselves by having good habits in the paths of God's grace and what a wonderful place that is to be. And so in personal Bible meditation and prayer, for instance, good habits open up space for us to move beyond always asking how and when and, and where to hearing from Jesus, getting to know and enjoy him and speaking to the Father through him in prayer. And so it's not the act of itself of reading the Bible that warms our hearts and changes our lives, but it's seeing the Lord Jesus with the, with the eyes of your heart, seeing in, the, in your mind, being encouraged, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. And that's in 2 Corinthians 3.18. Seeing Jesus, seeing the Lord Jesus, it glorifies our souls. And the soul that is being glorified is the soul that is preserving or persevering. Good habits help us to keep on going. Secondly, habits protect what's most important. They keep us from having to make the right decision over and over again. The power of good habits and the danger in bad habits is they save us from regular reconsideration and the energy tax of decision making. Will I go to church today? Will I, get, will I go to church tomorrow? Uh, well, you know, I could go and do that. I could go down the coast and go swimming. I could go and watch those car races. I could, I don't know, I could go and play golf. I could do something else. I could just sit and relax. I could have a sleep in. But if it's your regular habit that you come to church on Sunday, that's what you do. You're in the groove. You just get up in the morning and there's no questions asked. you put on your clothes, you walk out, you put on your church clothes, you do those things out of habit. And as a result of that, you're putting yourself in the path of God's grace. Our dogs know our habits. On Sunday mornings, they get a dentist stick. I don't know, I don't know how they know, but I tell you what, Sunday mornings, they won't leave me alone till they get it. They know when I get up in this clobber and start walking around, they know it's Sunday. They know it, they're going to get something special. They know that. And that's the power of habit. Deciding whether to go to God's word first thing in the morning isn't a productive or helpful decision to make every day. Whether to meet with fellow believers isn't something to reconsider every Saturday night or Sunday morning. And whether to be present at a, um, a weekly home group during the week 
Make the decision, barring rare exceptions, to be there. Make the commitment, form the habit, so that you're not stuck asking the same questions and trying to make the same decision over and over. Good habits protect what's most important. They keep us on the track of perseverance even when we don't feel like persevering. I don't want to go today. I don't feel like it. I'm shot to bits. I had a big day yesterday. I had to drive from there to there. It took me four hours and I feel tired and I'm feeling weary. You've had that before, haven't you? You've been there. But you know, every time you make the effort and you get here today, you're blessed. And you go home and you say, wasn't that great to be there today? Wasn't it good to meet with fellow believers? Wasn't it good to hear God's word spoken? And so you're challenged and encouraged because you persevered. And so we need to, um, to keep on keeping on even when we don't feel like it because it helps us access the channels of God's grace in the times when we need it most. And that's, of course, when we don't feel like it. And as a result, we preserve and keep our souls. Good spiritual habits keep us in God's word and in prayer and among God's people, even as we ride the emotional ups and downs of life. And good habits preserve us or prevent us from making bad decisions. If you're not in the habit of um, perhaps doing, doing something uh, good, it um, leaves open the space in your life to do something that you wouldn't normally do, which could ultimately be a very bad decision. Thirdly, habits are not one size fits all. Perseverance in the Christian life is dynamic. It looks different based on your personal experience and your, how you're wired, the season of life that you're in, your current community, your history. All of these things make a difference on the way that you do life. It should be freeing to know that you're not called to live someone else's spiritual routines. When I started thinking about this, um, this topic and this message, I thought, oh, I'll just, I'll just Google Billy Graham and see what his habits were. Sure enough, bang, up it comes, Billy Graham, this were his habits, this is the way he habitually studied the Bible and what he did. I thought, I'll put in David Jeremiah. Bang, up it comes again, 17 habits of David Jeremiah and all this kind of stuff. So if you have a high-flying pastor that you follow or think about, uh, there'll be some habits recorded there. So there's plenty of stuff to follow, but you don't have to be a David Jeremiah or a Billy Graham. You're going to be yourself and you're going to follow those habits that work for you and allow you to be effective in the Christian life. So habits are person specific and God gives us flexibility in how the timeless, unchanging principles of his means of grace intersect with our timely changing personalized habits in life. And so you might be a shift worker. Well, probably you, when you get home at six o'clock a.m., you're going to bed. And so maybe the habit might be to read the Bible at some other time. You might be a morning person and you like getting up early and reading the Bible early in the morning. You might be an evening person and you want to read it at night. Make the habit that suits your situation. It might be something to do with where you live, who you live with. Being able to um, develop habits that fit in. One way to say it is we don't have to wear Saul's armor. And you'll remember and recall the story of David and uh, when he went to visit his, his brothers at the battle against the Philistines. And um, of course, when David stepped up to, to Saul and said, oh, well, I'll go and fight Goliath. Saul tried to put on all his armor, didn't he, onto David. And David said, I haven't tested this. I haven't tried it. I can't, I can't work with this. 
I don't, I, I'm not used to it. And um, David said to Saul, I can't go with these. I've not tested them. So David put them off and then he took his staff in his hand and he chose five smooth stones from the brook, put them in his shepherd's pouch. His sling was in his hand and he approached the Philistine that way in the way that he was able to, uh, to use the uh, equipment that God had given him. And the reason that he was able to use that equipment, because he had made a habit of slinging stones. That was his habit. He was a shepherd. David was a young shepherd boy. And if you, um, if you want to Google the fields around Bethlehem, because um, that's where David was from, his dad was Jesse of Bethlehem. Right? Those stones are full of rocks. Sorry, those fields are full of rocks. There would have been more stones there to throw and sling than you could find anywhere. And um, it was just a habit, I'm sure, that he had that proved to be a great skill and God was able to use. I remember uh, as a young fellow just walking up the track at home. It was a kilometre from the road gate to the house. Right? The Mallee is full of limestone. We just used to pick up stones and we'd be throwing stones for as long as it took. So every star picket was a target, every bird was a target, every strain of post was a target. They were all targets. You got okay at it, throwing stones. And that habit of David was put to good use by God in slaying uh, the, uh, the giant of Gath, Goliath. And so how will you fight the giant who wants to keep you from persevering in the faith? You don't have to wear another man's armour, but you do have to find your way to wield the weapon of the Spirit. And so in Romans 8 it says, If you live according to the flesh, you will die, but if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Perseverance happens by the Spirit. And he works by God's word, the sword of the Spirit. And in that passage of Scripture in Ephesians 6, it reminds us that through faith we put on the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness. We have our feet shod with the gospel of peace. We put on the helmet of salvation and then the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And so we need to take up the sword Develop tactics in fighting the battle of perseverance because it is a battle. But the key is not whether you swing it like somebody else, but you swing it in a way that God enables you to because it's he who fights for you. Helpful spiritual ha habits and true Christian perseverance are not driven by mere duty but by joy. Habits, you know, are driven by desire. Habits are, are driven by desire to, to make a change. And if you make a New Year's resolution and you have a desire to change something, if you do it often enough, it will become your habit. And um, habits are driven by desire. And what an asset it is to our Christian perseverance to desire and reward drive our habits. And God designed you and I that way. Habits are an earthly gift to perhaps open our mouths for the taste of heaven. Taste him. Taste and see that the Lord is good. And so habits and spiritual habits are driven not by mere duty but by joy and in Hebrews 10 35 it mentions a great reward that is coming to those who persevere and what is the reward verse 34 of this passage is the key you joyfully accepted the plundering of your possessions since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and abiding one 
The early Christians accepted the loss of their earthly possessions because they knew they had a better and lasting heavenly possession. So the ultimate goal of cultivating holy habits is having Jesus, possessing him by faith, knowing and enjoying him. He's the great end of perseverance. He himself is the centre. He's the apex, the essence of our great reward. What habits of grace do for our souls and how habits of grace play an essential role in our perseverance in the faith is turn our eyes away from, from the subject of our faith and uh, turn us to the object of our faith, the Lord Jesus himself. And in Hebrews 12, 2, it says, For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, despising its shame. So we're not persevering because uh, we think we're going to have to. We're persevering because we want to see Jesus. We persevere because we want to be with him. We persevere because we want to know and enjoy the Lord Jesus. We want to hear God's voice in his word. We want to have his ear when we pray. <clears throat> and if we belong to his body, it helps us get our eyes off ourselves so that we might regularly taste the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. And so habits help to make persevering in the faith not about us and our actions, but about knowing the Lord Jesus. The Lord Jesus prayed in John 17, This is eternal life that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. And so the great reward that drives our habits is knowing him. The great end of all our habits and all our perseverance is a person. So day in and day out we can say, let us know, let us press on to know the Lord. In Philippians 3, in closing, 7 to 8, it says, But whatever would, things were gained to me, I now consider loss, this is Paul speaking, for the sake of Christ. What's more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I might gain Christ. And the habits that you put in place enable you to gain Christ. And so may your habits enable you to be found in the paths of God's grace. So his love and his grace and mercy can run over you and encourage you as you continue on for him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for the opportunity to, um, to start a new year. I want to thank you for the opportunity to trust you and follow you. I want to thank you again for the opportunity to be found in the paths of your grace and mercy. We thank you, Father, for that. And we pray that today, because we've made the decision to come to church today, that you would encourage us in the Lord. And I pray that we could worship you and give glory to you. And I pray that our souls will be encouraged, will be challenged and enabled throughout the week to continue the habit of following Jesus. And we thank you. Amen.